Sorry, please come to the front for the artist Q&A. Thank you. There's lots of seating up in the front for everyone who's here. Sure, a lot of you have curious questions for the artist. Please come sit in the front row. Don't be afraid. Why is it people never like to sit in the front row? <laughs> Please come on up. You know, it's funny because if I remove this row, then nobody will sit in that row. <laughs> Come on in, there's plenty of room up here to sit. Come and have a seat, everybody. Well, first of all, I'm going to start... Um, I'm going to start by introducing um, our artist, David Jang. Uh, David Jang is a LA-based sculptor. He was born in Seoul, Korea. How many of you have been watching the Olympics? It's exciting, right? Nobody has time. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, David is known for his uh, inventive kinetic installations, which employ hacked consumer electronics and subverted household appliances. By using electrical mechanical engineering techniques to create an interactive, uh, I'm sorry, several interactive motorized art forms, uh, he's propelled by the notion of systems of production and what it means to redirect the short life of cast off mechanical parts and equipment into genuine objects of beauty. Recycled and repurposed materials in turn become approachable, lovely, and last, long lasting. Um, he received his fine arts degree from the College of Visual Arts in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's shown internationally and nationally at the Nagasaki Museum of Fine Arts in Japan. Um, the Pleiades Gallery? Pleiades, I should have asked. The Pleiades Gallery in New York. Uh, the Heritage Art Center in Manila, the Philippines. The Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Laguna Art Museum in Laguna Beach. The Municipal Art Gallery in Los Angeles. The Palos Verdes Art Center. The Los Angeles Art Association. Fort Mason's Festival Pavilion in San Francisco. The Locust Project in Miami. And the Downtown Art Center Gallery in Los Angeles. He's been featured in several arts publications, including Art Limited Magazine, Huffington Post, Korean American Magazine, Art Pulse Magazine, Artillery, the KCET Art Bound Series, Korea Times, the Caligula Art Magazine, California Contemporary Art Magazine, Art Week LA, and was featured in the Los Angeles Art Show and Catalog in 2013, where we initially met. And most recently, he's been featured for his show here at Cal Poly Pomona. We've been placed on the list for What's Hot in LA, Art Events You Should Check Out by Art and Cake, a contemporary art magazine with a focus on Los Angeles art scene. So that's a big deal. All of those things are a really big deal. So we're really lucky to have him here with us. Um, this show is the first in the prequel of 2018 series of exhibitions that are held here at the Kellogg Art Gallery that were previously highlighted in 2015 and 2016 at the smaller Huntley Gallery located on the fourth floor of the library. In 2015, we did a smaller version, an introductory taste or snapshot of David James' work at the Huntley Gallery, which is very well received and attended. So I'm very delighted that we have, our plan was always to have a small show there just to give you a taste 
and a really big show here. How many of you were here in 2015 and were able to attend that first exhibition? I know some of my staff, raise your hand, <laughs> a few of you. Um, so uh, we had a great experience working with you that time and it's been ever so delightful to do it again in a much larger scale this time. So uh, I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for all your hard work and energy and getting all of this to happen because this takes a lot of work to put together. Uh, David really, really did a lot and my staff also worked really diligently as well. So um, I want to thank you for that. So just to start off this q and I want to ask the audience a couple of questions before we start. Um, how many uh, different majors do we have right here? Do we have any art majors here? Raise your hands. A bunch, all right. How many um, English majors do we have? How many engineering majors do we have? All right, got some engineers in the house. All right, any other majors you want to shout it out? Psychology. Psychology, awesome. What else? Theology. Theology. Geology. 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 Okay, geology. Wonderful. Who else? Anybody else? Is that it? No other majors? Kinesiology. Kinesiology. Great. So you're the movement of the body as opposed to the movement of objects. So you might see a connection there. I'm sure David will have some things to say about that. Um, so uh, just to, to better have a, a point of view, that's why I asked about what majors so that we get an idea of who's here so that we really can let people know. I mean, to be able to maybe work things around based on your majors. Um, so. To start off, I think one general question would be, David, why do you do what you do? I think whether you're a human, animal, or insect, two things. Um, we all want to live our life for ourselves. And uh, second would be we want to be a part of a bigger circumstance. And uh, by creating an art, I hope to benefit the community and uh, culture and history so that there can be more vibrant and more intellectual and philosophical training and exercising continue. And I think any country that are lacking developing in culture, uh, those people tend to have their limited perception. Their life is very different from compared to a person who is well continuously exercising culturally. Okay, so um, how about if you talk a little bit about that there's a little bit of, sorry, there's a little bit of philosophy in what you're talking about. Um, you talked a little bit about your work to me before about the idea of entropy. Yeah, that'll be a little quieter now. Um, the idea of entropy and what that, how that affects your way of thinking and um, your production of your work. And, you know, does anyone know what entropy means? Ed, where are you? Tell us what entropy means. Chaos. chaos the concept of constant chaos. Right. Um, entropy, laws of entropy is you known for chaos. Um, so, order um, requires energy. And uh, for you to live continuously, you need to have continuous transformation of the energy. So we humans, we eat food from plants, animals, and that comes into our body and transfer and transform. And our body um, produces cells, blood, uh, becomes skin, bone, and flesh, and you're able to do your activities, movements, and all this factor. So the order and continuous energy transformation is required. Um, if that stops, if you were to stop eating, your body is going to start to deteriorate and you will expire. So, so and also the order um, and energy continuation, um, that's what's related to us being mortal. Um, mortal means we should die someday, and dying means we all have time limits. And uh, time limits is what makes me possible. Uh, because time limits, we have this concept about I want to go see great kid before I die. I want to have a family at a certain age. I want to get myself educated and retire at a certain age. 
So anything and everything that we do we have to be done within time frame. And uh, this time frame uh, allows us to invent machines and tools that could replace and multiply our labor to accelerate our experiences. Pretty much like your cell phone, communication, internet networking, your car, transportation, then point A to point B, it gives you much more faster acceleration. Mm -hmm. How does this relate to your artwork? The mortem is, like I mentioned about, the keep continuation of processing and matter and energy cannot be destroyed. They can only be transformed and transferred. So my work, my installation, especially, isn't about completing final form. They're about constant process and progressing. Um, for the most artists, they start from scratch material, raw, and goes into completed form, but in most of the cases, I find myself going vice versa. I start from completed form, found objects and household appliances, I would disassemble them and then go back and make them into progress based installation. Their constant progression and the production of line and mass, and often, uh, they may look like very complex structure drawing overall. When you say a product, like pr production, that they are becoming something that is something else, um, how this, the concept of systems of production, which is the name of this show, how how is that how does that inform the artwork? We tend to um, discover hidden subtext and formulas and certain systems within nature and adopt that into our life. And all this casted material, um, three basic forms that exist, solid, liquid, gas. And uh, we pretty much use the temperature to cast the metal, plastic, glass, and bring them down to liquid form, and we cast them become the solid form. So we understand this type of methods and develop it through generation to generation and utilize them to our, our advantage. And for us, as a big mortal, we are always looking for a system that we can accelerate our experiences and reduce that experiences. So do any of you have questions? There's, there's definitely a lot of depth to his work. There's philosophical components. There's scientific components. Um, engineering, obviously, and of course, art. So I'd like for all of you to feel comfortable, maybe ask some interesting questions about maybe how he develops his ideas or how he creates his work, or anything that you'd like to ask him. This is a great opportunity. Um, you mentioned down pieces. A lot of the stuff is like it's repeating in its form, so is it manufactured thought or is it actually found recycled? They're a combination of, of everything. Sometimes I will found it, sometimes I will ask people to collect things, or sometimes um, I buy them and mess with this material. And the uh, main common thing is that this is what our life is surrounded with. Their mass production and uh, their what's available for most of the middle class to be able to get their hands on. So um, this mass production convenience and fast paced life, so that's what we involved in. Again. So to me, they're very natural. One thing I should mention is that there is a art historical phenomenon that has occurred uh, over time. Um, in, in the early 1900s, artists began to use objects from every day and implement it into their artwork. Picasso, for example, did that, um, taking pieces of newspaper or rope and turning it into a painting or a sculpture or a bicycle seat. A very famous um, uh, art artist named Duchamp um, basically took a latrine and put it in a museum, in a gallery, on a sculpture stand, and said, "This is art." Um, there's a concept about how art 
has meaning because we give it meaning. Um, we talk about it and communicate that meaning and we apply meaning to objects. Um, so there's been this, this long-standing understanding that objects that are in everyday can be, can add meaning to artwork. So um, the term found object is literally a way of expressing that. So if you ever hear that term, or even the term ready-made, those are two terms that um, define the idea of using objects from every day in the artwork to inform the work. Sure, or say about further that um, nothing in this world has a meaning. Even the ring that you wear, even even my work doesn't have a meaning. Not unless you go through a transition, then you are able to formulate meaning, the vocabulary within yourself. So meanings are always about in between. That was a good question. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? I'm curious how something is made or created? <clears throat> um, for example, this one, another thing to uh, say, you spend the time and hours on the day, the hours of your day building kids, or do you build the frame and you have people help you build it? Uh, what I do is the um, experimental projects are start from very small size and scale. Um, right, like and, and uh, before it, even before that, for me to get started, some may, something may have intrigued. Like if I were to uh, play with paper itself, if you were to roll paper like this, you can kind of see similar quality, but yourself have to do all the labor work. But what if you would have uh, electric motor replace your labor for you? Does it performance? And then you can even replace the paper with different material and see what they do and how much characterize that you can discover. My journey is to kind of discovering things. Um, I try not to go point A to point B, it's pointless to do that. But it's kind of like uh, when you are working with painting, you would discover new meaning within the painting medium and what those mark makers and colors are during the, uh, through the transition. I, I do the same with all this um, kinetic installation. During the process of working with them, um, I want to learn and understand what they are and how much further potential they can push. And uh, so I think step by step at a time. So when you started this work, I remember seeing it about maybe a year ago, could it be, or maybe nine months ago when I came to your studio. And I think you just had one of them, or one or two of them you had put together. I think it was just one, actually. And then you told me that you were gonna be making 10 of them, and I thought, what? <laughs> um, and so then it was like, well, if, ten, if you're building 10, then it becomes a wall in this space. And he said, yeah, a moving wall. Um, and I said, oh, okay, <laughs> that sounds awesome. So you end up, you know, with Part of the process I've seen it evolve with him as well is to start, you know, he starts from one thing and he works through that, all the problems and to the point where then he can replicate it multiple times. My installation works like kind of Lego block where you can continuously add and subtract. That's, um, most of the experimental installations that other artists make you install it and you destroy it after when the uh, expression is done, which I do have a few of those projects. And, but all this material that by there kind of pricey and also um, I want to figure out a way to keep continuously re reuse them like a sandwich. So each section are like a level block where I can add and subtract depending on the uh, very specific architecture of space. Yeah, that brings me to the point of the work that's in the opposite room over here with the fans. Um, Prevaricate is the name of it. And um, that piece he did in a different iteration for the LAX. Um, there's, a, there's an art, art cases, art exhibition cases in the LA airport. Which terminal is that? Terminal 3. Terminal Delta 3. Airlines. The Delta Airlines um, terminal. And uh, he did a, a much smaller version, about a third of the size. Right. Um, and it was, uh, so the same piece can have its own life in a different space. And it, he adapts the work 
to the space as needed. Um, in fact, the work that uh, the wire piece in the back, remind me of the title of the wire piece? Deflecting production. Deflecting production, which is the piece with the wires that come down that you can't really walk through, but you can see um, through uh, around its perimeter. Um, that piece originally we were thinking, well, can we make it even bigger for this space? The same thing with the mini blind piece in the back, which also, I forget the name. Um, subjective value. Subjective value, correct. Um, both of those, we were talking about seeing, uh, seeing, well, do we just want to put one of those pieces in the entire space, take up the whole space, and people could meander through just the mini blinds in the entire space. And then we thought, well, we could do a smaller version. When I first met David, that mini blind piece, subjectivity value, was on display at the LA uh, Art Fair. And people were meandering through it there. And it was much, it was large. It was about twice as big, right? About 25 feet. About 25 feet wide by? Um, 12, 15 wide. By 12, uh, 12 and a half feet wide. So this is a much smaller version of it. So as he says, he can adapt the pieces because they're compartmentalized pieces um, and parts. He can change them, change the dimensions based on the space's need. Um, any other questions about that? Or? Um, actually, yeah. you know, the traditional idea of sculpture is to cut into materials. And uh, I use complete farm materials, and I use them to cut into a space, to activate the space, and make the space more interactive and characterize the space. So um, I love the architectural um, space, like turn them into your own personal, interactable, experimental yeah. space as well. Yeah, speaking of that, uh, Michelangelo said that um, when he saw the stone that was to be later carved um, uh, to be the David, the famous Michelangelo's David, that he saw David in the stone and he, all he had to do was carve the marble away and free the form of David from the stone that was there. So it, I, whenever he says what he says about how he creates the artwork to cut through the space, I always think of like how Michelangelo also thought of things in that way. It's about breaking the uh, the materials and allowing the thing to come through. And in this space, in this in this uh, uh, circumstance, the space is the material that he's suggesting to cut through the architectural space. So that's very interesting and is particularly interesting for architecture students, I think. Go ahead. Um, could you share with us more of how you got here and what was the process of you really devoting into this subject matter of like notion kind of the trauma and And to, one thing to add to that is uh, David started off as a painter. Um, so the evolution, I'm sure, has come quite a long way. Oh yes, I've been through uh, many, many different stages. I started out as a hyper-realist painter. That was like when I was 13, 14 years old. Um, I would paint landscapes to life through portraits. Um, I don't know if any one of you know uh, the painter named Bob Ross. He just did a TV show and he does landscape painting for Bob half Ross. an hour. Yeah. And I used to do those landscape, used to do those landscape painting and sell it for like $40, 50 <laughs> But anyways, uh, so um, realism to during my college year, I, um, learned, I was learning philosophy and it just changed my whole perspective about art and painting. And I began beginning, uh, engaging abstract painting and getting get you into abstract expressionism. I was pretty much influenced by the um, Jackson Pollock, Hans Hoffman, Mark Rothko, those action painter. Um, so after college, my paintings were fairly large, like five by eight feet. So, in the my favorite, the favorite tip would be the like a whip, and uh, that would be enough size for my whole body to involve as an art too, like action painting and kind of performing within the painting. So during those painting for like ten years, and uh, um, I start questioning if I can transform and translate this action movement into something else and I started using bomb materials using like aluminum cans and metal and scrap metals and I started getting into sculpture and installation because 
everything is in that constant process of transforming and transformation, um, and also inventions of the machines and tools and electric models replaces our human labor. So why not have my work do its performance kind of art by using the electric motor? That's very interesting. <laughs> uh, yes, go ahead. Hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't know, but that, um, when I first came to U.S., I didn't speak any English, and um, only two classes that, that I was good at were math and art, because those two classes didn't require any language skills. And I remember taking an IQ test like what 10, 15 years ago, and it says I'm a visual mathematician. <laughs> so. I think whatever interest that I had back then must have still the pattern. So, uh, let, me, let me ask you this. Um, being that the math and the science are part of this is very much a part of, your, of you and your work, um, do you feel like that has anything to do with your cultural background? Did your parents influence you in any particular way, do you think, or push you in any particular directions? or perhaps anything that might have influenced you in that way? My father, um, he has been a chef all his life. And uh, I did learn how to cook from him, and I worked as a professional chef for several years. Um, but I don't know, maybe this one? This one. I don't know whether uh, cooking has anything to do with art. I'm sure you can see the relationship of cooking towards art. But yeah. I, none of my family does any engineering or art, but my brother is computer IT, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? Is someone almost raising their hand? Do you have a question? Anybody? Yes, go ahead. Um, so, the artwork for the wind uh, box, um, is there, uh, does it represent the, the mini, the mini blinds? Do you want to talk a little bit about what that's all about? Um, I would say yeah, they're more like a formal experiments. Um, I say like really strong bodies of horizontal lines. You know, one time they look like just a plane and cubicle, the other time they're like they're constructed like just a horizontal line. Um, it's two different things that separated them. First thing would be like man-made language. We call that a blind or even like a fork, you know, it's man-made. When you say fork, everyone will picture what they have used as a fork. And the uh, second priority will be like line, plane, volume, and texture. Um, I tend to experience them very like, intuitionally and subconsciously with this formal aspect. So if you have to look at such colors and lines, you could formulate um, your own like emotion and things, um, or, but my work isn't about social or political commentary. I'm sure some people could talk about blind opening and closing as like a privacy and all that. But yeah, I could get that. Um, but I think the main part is uh, my job is to put this work on the spotlight and it would be the audience's job to experience them and they can formulate their own thought process to a certain level. Yes, that's true. Um, and like I said, I'm a very intuitional person, and then my first priority attraction will be, it will be like um, formal uh, experiments. And I'm sure there is such a thing as like a mass production, fast paced lifestyle, and the wasteful, and all that issue is there, um, which for me that becomes very natural. I mean, we're, we're just around, um, and uh, there are certain things you may not really think about it, you may don't think about it. It's kind of like when you're walking on the earth, 
you think the Earth is flat, but if you actually move out of the space, you can see the Earth is round. Come to yourself. This is the timing that I am alive. So um, I'm just naturally engaged them like as if they're my own painting or art material medium. One of the things that first attracted me to his work was the fact that he was using recycled aluminum cans to create paintings of, in, of sorts. Um, a great example is over here in the court or gallery where there are strips of, of a, a certain colored aluminum cans like Coca-Cola and then the orange ones are Fanta and other the green, I think there's like a Arizona iced tea. And you start engaging in those products that we're used to seeing, but they look so beautiful. So there's something besides the sociopolitical conversations that we can have about recycling and repurposing materials. There's also, I think, what he's, what there's a certain level of beauty and understanding and studying form, or even the graphics, which I think graphic designers can appreciate, that those graphics that somebody once created for a can are now being reused and repurposed. So now the graphics are now recycled or repurposed, not just the can itself. And uh, it's becoming something that's completely, something completely different. We're not advertising Coca-Cola because there's all these other things there too. It's really more about the color, the shapes, the lines, the forms, the graphics of the work. And in some cases, he'll take even those aluminum cans and he'll torch them. You'll see some of these where the aluminum has sort of been, been uh, torched and been sort of broken down, so they're kind of burned. Um, and it, when you, it's funny because when you see uh, him use the aluminum cans, the Coca-Cola cans and other product-based aluminum, you could still see the mark of the graphic designer on those uh, cans, um, again, on those parts of the painting. So it's just the little wisp of Coca-Cola that you can see, um, or whatever the design was that was used on the can. Um, even when you torch it with fire and flame, that design still stays. It's a latent image of the original design, and I find that kind of fascinating because there's a lot of dialogue you could have just about that alone also. I had uh, some of the uh, collector that were um, interested in purchasing some of my aluminum can uh, with piano piece. And uh, some of the logo from certain like the can product is showing and that uh, they would not purchase because that logo is showing. Oh. I guess that was not like that company's logo or something. Which is a form of, of uh, rebellion or banning a product. Uh, which is, a, it's, a, it's not unusual for that to happen. It's pretty typical, yeah. Yeah, it can happen. Yeah. So if you really like the product, though, I imagine people buy something if they really like mm -hmm. what they see there. So. Um, was there, there was another question I thought someone raised there. Um, I have a, another question, so there's not going to be anybody else jumping in. I want you guys to take advantage of this as much as possible, more than me talking. But. Um, I'm very curious about how you title your work because English not being your first language, it's amazing how you title your work with such eloquent, complex words. Um, a lot of times, not always, sometimes they're very simple words like affirm or mode or rectify. But how do you come up with those titles? And I know this is kind of a banal question, but I find it intriguing because out of a lot of artists that I've worked with, I've never seen such almost scientifically named artworks. I don't know if, the, if I'm even using the right words for that, but. Hmm. I titled it very intuitively. Whatever um, certain with the colors or um, the response that I get, and to try to be honest, not to make it look fancy by title. Um, but um, like gut reaction, um, intuition, um, I think the way I can respond to the work, it's kind of like um, I look at our body as devices. Um, when you see something, most of us think that we are receiving or you don't receive. Our eyes are devices, they make it read. 
your ears, your nose, your smell, your tasting, your feeling, your emotions, so all the six senses, they are like devices that make and formulate sculpting vocabularies and keeps within ourselves. And when you are engaging with society, you are using the collections of this series of vocabularies to respond. And uh, often, all this vocabulary that you have formulated within yourself is like so complex and you don't even know. It's hard for you to keep track of what's what. So, yeah, I guess the intuition word would be okay. simplistic word. Because compulsory mm -hmm. vital, for example, I mean, compulsory is something mm -hmm. that has compulsion, so the movement can represent that, and vital. I guess I'm trying to understand what you, what your instincts are, why your instincts think the way, go the way they do with the different pieces. I guess the way the uh, shadow reflects and move continuously um, in many different directions. Um, because I, well, we humans throughout our whole life, we, making objects that is valuable to our living in life and pretty much I see that kind of reflection in that kind of work so because that's how that title came about. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any other questions? Yes. I was I'm fascinated with your um, engineering ability. Did you learn things to make art? Or did you did you ever start in engineering? Did you I'm not self taught. Um, I think my first project was the correlation cycle about eight years ago. And uh, yeah, I had to learn from scratch, like how to work with the electrical wires and the electrical motors and what, what's 12 VDC or 8, 8 BDC means or you know, how fast they can spin. And um, as more it gets into it, there, the, the whole process becomes like a painting. Um, you, discover things one by one very spontaneously. But in fact, the, um, this engineering, uh, they're involved in like actual 3D like movement, just like our body. That whole movement is far more complex than painting to me in a way. Um, so I think that's what makes me so excited. Um, you never know where you're going to end up um, discovering. In fact, the pre very good piece, I wasn't going to um, use the fan to create like a wind power generator project and then the privacy gets me into something what I have right now. But yeah, I mean nowadays um, if we need to learn something, all the resources are available. Books, internet, uh, we can now watch a video from YouTube. <laughs> so if you are interested bring your mind to you can pretty much learn any, anything. Amazing, not to <laughs> to self teach. <laughs> I think it has to do with, with I think it has to do with the, the we're all different, and David is wired a certain way, and <laughs> and I think that that's that's something that I, I find very fascinating, and also I think it's so fascinating to see that in your work that you've you know continuously. You're continuously learning and trying to adapt to things and create new things. And you know, if you think of it, he tries to do it. Have you have you done work where you have you really struggled with a concept and you just abandoned it all in a feasible way to do it? Was there any stories like that that you had? I almost um, abandoned the refrigeration project. Uh, one with the, uh, let, me, let me tell them, sorry. But in the back, there's three lit light pieces. And I don't know if you noticed when you went back there, but they actually give off cold refrigeration. How many of you noticed that? Okay. So if you want to go back there again, you'll see the condensation of the moisture in the air getting picked up by the components. And it's freezing, basically. And then as it slowly evaporates, it will drip into a little pan that's underneath the bottom of the artwork. So just in case anyone didn't notice that. Yeah, so they, uh, I mean, for me to learn the, uh, how the refrigeration system works, it took me a long time. And even I tried to learn through YouTube, it wasn't quite working. So at the end, I had to hire a technician. I had to pay the technician to hire, have a technician come by my studio, show me a few things, and that's how I learned it. But this project is really uh, it's beyond your control, so 
Right. That's, that shows a level of determination that mm -hmm. you have, that when you can't learn something, then you find somebody to show you how to use it, how to do it. I, I just love the refrigeration part, how the um, transformation of that water um, into liquid, solid, the moisture as gas. So um, I see so much potential in that project. Um, that, that's my first refrigeration project. So the next one, I'm thinking of experimenting something more room scale, like interactive. Something that would be take up an entire room okay, right. with mm -hmm. re refrigeration components. Mm -hmm. So you would walk in and feel the, the coldness of it. I think that there's some of the, uh, the refrigeration type of a uh, room, like a sauna, there's mm -hmm. cold. Yes, the, re the reverse of a sauna. Right, right. Yeah, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Does that sound interesting? It sounds interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody else? Yes? Um, I'm, most of the time I don't go point A to point B um, because what I have in my mind and what people know as idea, idea itself is past tense and I don't think they're all that fully reliable and I want to see how myself can be transformed and learn things during the progress. So, yeah, but that's the exciting part. It's kind of like adventure. You don't know where you're going to be end up, but you see something extraordinary and you, you feel like, wow, it's great. I first had them start um, upside down with only two motors and uh, just simple but scissor like movement. But um, if you were to do uh, at the gym, like doing your squat exercise on your knee and joint, kind of works like that too. And um, so you would like build the uh, section one by one and put them all together. And pretty much they're based on um, like a square frame. And uh, if you were to put curtains on one side at a time, they don't tangle up with each other. Yeah. So pretty much all those um, hanging rods are like a curtain, like it only hangs from one side only. But overall they look like they're all like chaotic. time when the, um, the fan piece, for example, um, when the strings go twist and untwist, I look at them like a paint brush stroke. Um, if you have to paint brush stroke on the canvas, it may be the same brush stroke, but they all come out differently. Each, every each time it comes out with their own characteristic. So the energy and the movement they do, they have their own characteristic, which to a certain point, um, I cannot control, and uh, I like that aspect of sometimes they happen, they're certain like spontaneous of their own things happen, like a brush is What is Your question was about how does a static work mm -hmm. come to life, or what's in his opinion? Mm -hmm. How can a static work, like your flat work, how does it, it come to life? Personally, I see in his work, I mean, I think he could really only speak about his work. I don't know that he can necessarily speak about other people's work, which I think your question was kind of almost about other people's in general, right? Yeah, in general. Um, I, I mean, you know, in looking at his flat work, and I invite you to stay after we're all done and look around some more, and you might see new things that you didn't notice before. Because when I looked at his work, like a, from a one point of view, and then I walk around the room and I look at it from a different point of view, I see it completely differently. This piece over here looked like it was silver and the orange I could see, but now it has more gold tones coming through. So here's a work that's static, but because of its surface and the treatment of the surface, and of course it's not, a very, very flat, refined surface. It's been torched, 
right? It's been banged up, and you get the activity that comes from the light around it. And you put every different type of light on that, it changes. Like right now, we have this artwork off. We've got a lot of light off in this room. It'll change when we turn the lights on. Um, in other parts, like for example, the work behind you all, I'm looking at it right now, all three of those works, they're basically all squares, all the same shape, all placed on these flat surfaces, but each of them take on their own unique quality. And I think a lot of that has to do with the materials that he's using and how he treats them. I, the microphone fell. Um, but yes, I'll go ahead and let you talk. Um, I think that their artists, every artist has to kind of find their way of being able to create that effect of something. If they want to have something kind of come to life or have that movement or light effect, that's something an artist has to discover with their own work. So like, torching is a very um, um, heavy factor in my two-dimensional work. It's like, instead of using paintbrush and knife, I would use power tools and paintbrush and things. Or, or, or like a um, torch. And, uh, um, we have, we tend to have this fetish on mechanically highly polished finished materials and things nowadays. Your cell phones, your cars, how they're polished up in your furniture, so furniture and things. And uh, those polished material means to keep them in a longer lasting of their life. So even all these mirrors and moons, they come in all like coated. And if I were to uh, torch them and burn off the coating immediately, sense of uh, deterioration happens, sense of like tiny performing that happens onto those material. Yeah, one thing about the torching of the materials is that it almost, you know, like you say, it's like you're speeding up the death of the material in a way, or what we might consider. Um, I, you know, you look at some of the metals and they, they look like they've been like buried underground or in a fire or beaten up and, you know, or in a, an accident of some sort. And so it starts to bring on its own characteristics. I mean, I look at some of the materials that are really worn down and I go, wow, it almost looks like an artifact. You know, 200, 300 years from now, they're going to look at that and say, wow, it's an artifact of that time because it looks so, like, it has that wearing, that nostalgic wear effect that we think of when we think of Roman or Greek artifacts that are found in, arche in archaeology. Anybody else have a question? There's some great questions, by the way, you guys. Thank you so much for that. Anybody have any more for David? It's a great opportunity if you have any. And, um, if anybody has any other questions, you feel free to, and he'll be here for a bit longer. We're here till six tonight. If you want to ask him to come up or something you, didn't, you were a little shy about asking, feel free to, to do so. Um, and I invite you all to come again tomorrow um, on Saturday night. We'll be having the opening reception. It's open to the public. If you want to bring family and friends, bring a date uh, to an opening, we'll have refreshments again. It'll be even Looks like our refreshments are all gone. <laughs> so um, it, please feel free to come again and, and re-explore because I think you'll find new things each time you come and visit. All right, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Thank you, David, for, for being here. And as usual, I want to also thank my wonderful staff for all they do. Um, my staff is solely students run. Um, and they're all fantastic, and they do a great job. So thank you all, those of you who are here. I appreciate it.